Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. Um, so if you've been following up with uh, current events in my life, I have recently left Google and I'm actually doing some traveling. I'm in Amsterdam, hence the change of scenery here. Um, for those of you who are wondering why I'm not able to post more often than one time a week, I'm probably spending about 22 hours a day and hence I'm a little bit distracted. You know, I've been considering front-end development more so than distributed systems in the past, you know, couple of weeks. But for what it's worth, I'm still trying to get things out every once in a while, like I mentioned, and this will probably be the case for the next two-ish months. But obviously, I'm still going to post videos whenever I can. So today, we are going to be covering two-phase locking, so let's go ahead and get into it. Okay, I've got the iPad out, so let's go ahead and get started. So the subject of today's video is two-phase locking. So two-phase locking is just another method of achieving isolation or serializability, which effectively just means that when we have a bunch of transactions going on concurrently within our database, it seems as if they were just running one at a time. So in our last video, we kind of discussed how we would do this by literally running them one at a time in terms of actual serial execution. However, for today, we're going to figure out a better way of doing that by using a bunch of locking. So let's go ahead and get started. Typically, two-phase locking is something that has been used in the past because actual serial execution wasn't feasible, CPUs weren't fast enough, and so you'll see this in a lot of traditional SQL databases. Okay, so the thing that we're going to start out with as follows. As you can see, I have myself a row right here. You know, we can go ahead and draw it out. And imagine that the columns of this row are basically my name and a shopping cart of items that I want to purchase. And it's got a corresponding lock. So basically in the past, at least in my race condition videos, what I've kind of spoken about is locks basically means exclusive access to this piece of data, right? I couldn't read a row unless I grabbed the lock. I couldn't write a row unless I also grabbed the lock. So now what we've got is this concept of basically two-phase locking, where instead of just being a lock is enabling you exclusive access to the row itself, you may actually have a concept of shared access. So in two-phase locking, basically what we've got is the following. We have a reader lock and also a writer lock. So consider them the same lock, but basically it's got two modes. So if we want to go ahead and read this row, what I can do is go ahead and grab the lock right here in reader mode. And basically if I want to then write to it, I would have to upgrade that to a writer mode. But the kind of trick here is that multiple threads or multiple transactions can be reading a row, but effectively, in order to write to that row, you have to be the only one grabbing the locks. You need to wait for all of those readers to leave and then upgrade your access to exclusive. So basically, the reason this works is that for something like a read modify update cycle, which is basically the cause of many different race conditions within databases, we know that our predicate, aka the read, is always going to remain valid because of the fact that whatever rows we're reading in our predicate can't be modified because no one is going to be able to upgrade to get the writer lock because we're concurrently reading them. So again, it means the predicate is valid, hence this two-phase locking approach actually works. So what is a big issue that we have to work with here? And I'm going to circle this over and over and over again because it's the most important thing when it comes to two-phase locking is deadlocks. So let's go ahead and show a diagram of how this might happen because you might say to yourself, oh, well, Jordan, well, if everyone grabs the resources in the same order, it's impossible to have deadlocks, right? Well, no, that's not necessarily the case. So let's imagine that if I put a square on a lock, that means I'm grabbing it in reader mode. And if I put a circle on the lock, I'm grabbing it in writer mode. So basically, again, I'm doing the name shopping cart example again. We've got Jordan and Snoop Dogg two very real realistic shopping carts for the both of us, so let's go ahead and get started. Let's imagine that myself and Snoop Dogg look at each other's shopping carts and we say, oh shoot, you know what? I like those items that they have. Let's go ahead and add those to ourselves. So what we're both gonna do is read each other's shopping cart and then basically take all those items and add them to our own. So what that first entails is let's imagine now that this is the Jordan transaction, right? So first, Jordan, aka myself, is going to grab the reader lock for the Jordan lock it's going to grab the reader lock for the Snoop Dogg because I need to be able to read a list in order to modify it. And similarly, I need to be able to read the Snoop Dogg row in order to eventually get the items from it so I can add them to my cart. And then similarly, Snoop Dogg, which is executing at the same exact time, he's gonna grab the reader lock for himself and he's also gonna grab the reader lock for Jordan, right? Because we're both reading both our own and the other person's shopping card 
in order to eventually make this update. So now what we would want to do is try and grab the writer lock, right? But I've told you earlier that you can't grab a writer lock unless you are the only person that's trying to write that row, right? If I were to put a circle here, that would be bad. It would break the invariant that you know a writer lock needs to be exclusive. So what we have here is a deadlock. I can't complete my write until Snoop Dogg completes his write, and he can't complete his write until I've completed my write. So we have a deadlock. And what that means is that basically we need to go ahead and avoid those somehow. So the issue with deadlocks is that it makes two-phase locking slow. The reason for this being that there are a bunch of deadlocks, like I've just described, and the system effectively has to detect them and abort them. Right? It's going to have to go back, it's going to have to cancel one of the transactions that's part of the deadlock, and then run them again. So basically, in order for this to work, you know, Snoop Dogg, I would have to go ahead and pause this, I would have to run Jordan to completion, and you know, once that's done, then I can run the Snoop Dogg transaction. So obviously that is going to take quite a bit longer, we're no longer running them concurrently, and that's a problem. Okay, and then in addition to basically deadlocks, which are a big problem with two-phase locking, it takes a lot of resources to grab the locks, so that's slow too. And everything is defensive as well, you know, we're grabbing locks when we don't even necessarily need them. We didn't even necessarily cover all of our race conditions. Still, our system here is not perfect. So let's remind ourselves about phantoms. I covered these, I think, two videos ago. But basically, uh, phantoms are when you do a read modify update cycle, and the update part is actually adding new rows to your table. So in this case, basically, let's imagine that uh, you know a phantom example would be this. My friend and I both want to join a class with an enrollment capacity of three. So let's imagine that class is the flexibility class at 6 p.m. So it's going to be these two rows right here, which I put X's in front of. And right now, there are already two people in it. So we would run the following SQL query on the right over here put an arrow over there, and we'd basically say, you know, select all the count uh, from the classes, basically, let's imagine the table name is classes, where the class name is flexibility and the class time is six o'clock. I personally would like to get more flexible for reasons I don't want to talk about. And so basically the issue now is that what's going to end up happening is that we're both going to write rows to this table, you know, with myself and then him over here with my friend, Jordan's friend. And so now there are four people in the class. Why are there four people in the class? Because these rows didn't even exist yet. So we couldn't put locks on them to prohibit each other from writing. All we did was both grab the reader locks, like so, like we saw just before, and then we were both able to make a write. There was nothing prohibiting us because again, there's no locks to be had on these two rows that don't yet exist. So like I say over here, we need to be able to lock rows that don't even exist yet. So how can we fix this? Well, there's something known as predicate locks. So predicate locks are basically allowing us in certain databases to grab all rows that fit certain conditions. So in this case, you know, I wanted to get my predicate by figuring out all the rows where the class name was flexibility and the class time was six o'clock. So in the case of a predicate lock query, I would say to myself, well, okay, I know that this is kind of the predicate I want to put a lock on. So before I actually make my write, please put a lock on all of the rows where the class name is flexibility and the class time is six o'clock. And that way, if the row doesn't even exist yet, it would still have a lock on it because it fits those parameters. That being said, the issue with predicate locks is that they're slow to run. We have to evaluate this entire query where class name is flexibility, class time is six o'clock. And if there's not necessarily an index that perfectly corresponds with this query, this could be very slow to run and evaluate. So. What we move on to then is the last part of this lesson called index range locking. I basically already described this predicate lock where I would go ahead and search out these two rows in the table and lock them. But the issue with that is it takes a while. Why? Well, let's imagine we have this table right here where we have an index on the class name field, but we don't have an index on the class time field. The index is indicated by this asterisk here. So because class time is not necessarily organized in a linear manner, it's not going to be easy to find these two rows. But what is really easy is if we just search by class name because there's an index on class name and that means that everything is sorted that way. So what we could actually do instead is simply grab the lock for all the rows in flexibility because it's really easy to find all the flexibility classes in O of log n time simply by virtue of the fact that uh, there is an index on that field.
And so now we can go ahead and lock more rows than we actually need to because it's a little bit faster to run that query. This does come with the one disadvantage of the fact that, well, now if we're locking more rows than we necessarily need to, it's possible that other queries that didn't have to be blocked are now going to be blocked. So you want to be careful about doing this, right? You wouldn't want to lock the whole table, for example, just to run a very small query, because then we're going to be blocking all transactions. So it's a delicate balance, but the point is, you know, if you have to run a super in-depth query, sometimes it's better to actually just lock a superset of the rows Right, we're actually locking more than necessary because running the query to figure out which rows to lock is a little bit faster. Okay guys, I hope that makes sense. And as always, hope you have a great day. I will see you in the next video.